As Jack said, tonight we'll be talking about log repo and how it enables data-driven decisions here at Indeed. My name is Jeff Chen and I'm a software engineer. Indeed is the number one job search site worldwide. It's available in over 50 countries and 28 languages. And every month we have over 100 million unique visitors. I help people get jobs by working on the Indeed Apply team. And our goal is to make it easy for job seekers to apply to jobs. The way this works is that people first perform a search on Indeed. We return a list of job results that match your query. And a lot of these jobs will let you know that you can apply with your Indeed resume. This lets you know that it's integrated with Indeed Apply. Once you click on one of these jobs, you're taken to the job description page where you can see the full job description. And you'll notice that on the right hand side, there's a bright orange button that says Apply Now. Once you click on this Apply Now button, if you're one of the tens of millions of people who already have an Indeed resume, the only thing you need to do is fill out an optional cover letter and then click Apply. If you do not already have an Indeed resume, then we'll ask you for some contact information such as your name and phone number, and then we'll ask you to choose a resume to upload from your computer or mobile device. So what just happened was, job seeker performs a search, they view a job, they click Apply Now, and then they submit their application. We need to know that all of these things happened because knowing how users are interacting with our systems will help us build better products. Once we have this information, we can analyze it and see interesting insights. For example, if you already have an Indeed resume when you click the Apply Now button, you're over 50% more likely to complete the apply process than if you had to upload a resume. We have lots of questions across all of our products. Things like, what percentage of applications are using Indeed resume? How many job seekers are searching for Java in Austin? How often are job seekers editing their resume once they've uploaded it? And how long does it take for us to visit employer sites and aggregate their jobs? These questions get a lot more complicated too. For example, how many applications to jobs from CareerBuilder by job seekers who search for Java in Austin use an Indeed resume? Is the percentage of people who do this different on web than it is from mobile? And has this changed over time? With more information, we can make better decisions. So we need to log all the events that happened, job searches, clicks, and applies. And for each event, we also need to log everything. We never know what effect a change might have. The types of things that we log are things like client information, user behavior, system performance, and the A-B test groups that a user is in for a request. Once we have this data, we can use it to make better decisions. We don't want to be making decisions based on assumptions, nor the highest paid person's opinion. So our objective is we want to collect data on user actions and system performance from all of our applications in all of our data centers across the world. At Indeed, we have a few principles that we apply to all the systems that we build. They need to be simple, fast, resilient, and scalable. By simple, I mean that the system should have an easy interface to use. It should be easy to both write logs as well as read them. We also want to reuse familiar technologies. We don't want to reinvent the wheel where we don't have to. This means that we like to reuse technologies that Ops already understands very well, things like gzip in rsync. The system should also be fast. Writing logs from our application should have no negative impact on runtime performance. In addition, once logs have been written, we want the data to be available very soon for consumers. The system should also be resilient, and in it, writes should be durable. Once an application writes a log, it should show up in the system, even in spite of network failures or system downtime. Last, the system needs to be able to scale to handle the large amounts of data that we throw through it. And as of today, this is on the order of terabytes each day. The system needs to be powerful enough to represent any kind of data that we need it to and we should store all of data for all of time, unsampled. Events should be stored at least once so that writes are never lost. We may store it multiple times for redundancy purposes, but consumers should never read a duplicate event. It should be very easy for developers to add new data to logs as we roll out new features. And on the flip side, it should also be extremely easy to access our logs in large amounts at a time for a given time period. And this is our most common access pattern. We look at everything that happened over a certain time period and then analyze it. 
Because of this is our most common access pattern, we didn't optimize for random access to individual events. We also care more about completeness of, log, uh, of logs, so we didn't optimize for real-time access. In addition, we did not have explicit support for complex data types, but I'll elaborate more on that later. Our solution is called LogRepo. It's a distributed event logging system, and we've been using it in production for all of our applications since the end of 2006. Inside log repo, every event is called a log entry. And inside of a log entry, everything is stored as a string. Data is URL encoded into key value pairs, exactly like the query string in a URL. Here's what an example log entry looks like for an organic click event. It's a large blob of text. But once you insert new lines after ampersands and URL decode the values, it becomes much more readable. And you can see that we can support both text data as well as numeric values. This log entry format has a lot of advantages. First of all, it's human readable. This means that anyone, not just developers, can take a log entry and get useful information out of it. Log entries also have arbitrary keys. There's no set schema ahead of time, so developers have it very easy in order to add new data to logs. And because of the format, it's very easy to append the data as we get new data. Log entries are also self-describing. So just by looking at keys and their values, you can determine what you're looking at, whether it's timing information or a user search query. And it's easy to parse in any language. Each log entry has two required keys, UID and type. Type is simply an arbitrary string which describes the contents of the log entry. UID is always the first key in a log entry. It's a unique 16-character base32 string, which means it uses the characters 0 through 9 and A through V. And a UID encodes several pieces of important information. First of all, it encodes a timestamp of the event. This has millisecond level granularity, and we have enough bits for it to represent 1,000 years of time. Next, it also stores some server information uh, on the server ID and application instance ID that produced the event. Last, it has some version information as well as a random value. Since UIDs are unique, this random value is essential for making sure we don't have any UID collisions within a given millisecond. And this random value is just a number between 0 and 8,191. This means that we can support up to 8,000 events per an application instance per a millisecond. And this UID format also has some benefits. It stores all the useful information I just described, plus it compacts it into a nice format, which is useful when you're processing millions or billions of logs. Because timestamp is, makes up the most significant bits in the UID format, you can take whole log entries and easily sort them by time. So let's take another look at what I talked about earlier. A job seeker comes to Indeed and they search for jobs. They click on some of the results and maybe apply to a few of those jobs. All of these events are part of the same flow, and it's important that we're able to tie these events together in order to fully understand the job seeker's experience. To do this, we model the events into a parent-child relationship. And in this model, children can reference their parent events by what we call a tracking key, or TK for short. This TK contains the value of the UID of the parent event. And it's important to note that this abbreviation of TK is just a convention. It can be called anything. So children know who their parents are, but parents do not necessarily know who their children are because most of the time, once we log the parent event, we don't yet know if there are going to be any child events. This is an extremely powerful model for us. So for example, if you perform a job search and you click on one of the events, the log entries may look something like this. You have your parent job search entry, and then you have your, chi your child organic click entry, and that has a TK pointing to the UID of the job search event. And we have lots of child events for job search alone. This includes things like sponsored job clicks, JavaScript errors, job alert signups, and many more. So how does Indeed Apply use log repo? Here's a slightly modified version of the events I was talking about earlier. First, a job seeker views the job page. And when this happens, we create a log entry called the view job log entry. As part of this page load, we execute some JavaScript that enables the Indeed Apply functionality on the right. 
This creates another log entry that refers to the tracking key or UID of the view job entry. Once the user has filled out the information and submitted the application, we log another event. And this refers back to the JavaScript loading event. Finally, once we have the application on the back end, we will post it to the employer's applicant tracking system. And this logs yet another event that refers to the submission event. All these events form together to uh, form a chain together and give us an idea of a job seeker's path through the application process and then what we actually did with their application once we got it. Another use case that we have for parent-child relationships is for something we call the JavaScript latency ping. And what happens is when you perform a search, your browser will execute some JavaScript that makes an HTTP request to Indeed. Once we receive this ping, we log an event. So these events might look something like this. You have your parent job search entry, and then once we receive the latency ping, we create a latency event. A really convenient feature of how we log the parent event's UID in the child event is that it makes it very easy for us to determine how much time has elapsed between two events. And to do this, we parse the timestamp information out of both the child event and the parent UID. And then we take the difference of these values. So here we can see that there was a latency of about 200 milliseconds. And what this does is approximate the time from when we received a request to when a job seeker begins rendering their response. And we're able to see this information. Here's a graph of the perceived latency from our West Coast data center to Washington and California. And in this graph, California is in red. And it's about 175 milliseconds as the median value. Whereas in Washington, it's about 190 to 200 milliseconds for their perceived latency. This makes sense since our West Coast data center is located in California. Writing log entries from your applications is extremely easy. This is all the code you need, and I'll go through it step by step. First, you use a factory method to create the log entry. And all you need to do is pass it the log entry type. The factory method is in charge of creating the UID, and it'll use the current time as its timestamp. Once you've created the log entry, you populate it by calling the setProperty method, and that takes a key and a value. Earlier, I talked about how we did not have explicit support for complex data types, yet we needed log repo to be powerful enough to express anything that we need to. So lists is a more complicated type, and the way we represent lists is by taking elements and delimiting them by commas. Once you've written this to a log entry, the commas get URL encoded into percent two Cs, but this compresses back down very nicely. Taking that a step further, we also support lists of tuples. And we encapsulate tuples using parentheses. Within a tuple, elements are delimited by commas just like they were in lists. For example, when you perform a job search, we log all of the job results we return to you. And for each job result, we like to log both the job ID and the relevancy score, along other things. So here's what that looks like. It's important to note that if we need to, we can also URL encode the value within the list, which means that it'll be doubly encoded in log repo. Once you've fully populated your log entry, you simply call commit on it. And at this point, it hands off the log entries to a system that's maintained by our operations team. And Jason Copy will explain more on that. Thanks. I'm Jason Copy, and I'm one of the systems administrators here at Indeed and I engineer systems that help people get jobs. Prior to the log repository, we still needed to understand what was happening inside of our applications. The way that we did this is using debugging logs. Developers and systems administrators would manually look at these logs and figure out what the applications were doing. And we use a logging framework called Log4j to do that. Log4j is an open source Java logging framework that enables our developers to write code that specifies what should be logged and enables the operation staff to create a configuration that defines what goes where. In Log4j's terminology, the where is called an appender. And these could be things like files or SMTP servers. 
So prior to log repository, we were using log4j and a file appender to create these debugging logs for humans to read. And we wanted to reuse this powerful paradigm when creating the log repository. And so that's what we started with. Log4j using a file appender to create log repository logs, which were meant to be consumed by programs. However, we also realized that we wanted redundancy for the log entries as fast as possible. And what this meant is writing to multiple locations. The first thing, the first destination we wrote to is a file, and we used the file appender to do this. We also wanted to write to two separate remote servers, and we needed to find a, an appender that helped us do this. When we began to investigate how to write to remote servers, it was clear that the overwhelmingly popular platform from doing this is a protocol called syslog, which is a protocol for transporting messages across an IP network established in the 1980s. Out of the box, log4j only supports UDP-based syslog appenders. And UDP is a network protocol that could result in data loss. For the log repository, we wanted to avoid data loss at all cost. So we wanted to use a network protocol called TCP, which guarantees data transfer. So we created something called the, TC, the syslog TCP appender, which is a TCP-enabled log4j syslog appender that buffers messages in memory before transporting them to the remote server. Um, this makes the syslog TCP appender resilient in the face of short downtimes for the network or the remote server. We also needed to choose a syslog daemon. We chose something called syslog next generation, which is simply a syslog daemon that supports TCP, and it was created in 1998. Putting all of this together, we were able to achieve redundancy with log4j by using a file appender to write to the local disk and using two instances of the syslog TCP appender to write to two separate remote servers. And this is what the system architecture looks like with the application using log4j and these two types of appenders to ultimately write to three separate destinations. On each of the syslog servers, the syslogng daemon receives unsorted log entries from the cluster of applications and immediately flushes those entries to files on disk and to files that we call raw logs. So now the architecture looks like this, where the application is using log4j to write out through the syslog TCP appender to the syslog ng processes, which write into these raw logs. Up until this point, we've optimized the system for redundancy. And at this cost, the raw logs on the syslog servers are probably out of order. And this happens because all of the applications that are writing to the syslog server are independent. They're not coordinating together to ensure that the entries arrive at the syslog server in sorted order. And this is OK, because the next major component in the architecture is, the, is called the log repository builder, or builder for short. And its responsibility is optimizing the log entries for our read access patterns. And it does this by sorting, deduplicating, and compressing the log entries. So now our architecture looks like this with syslog writing the raw logs. And when we introduce the builder, it reads from these raw logs in order to sort, deduplicate, and compress the log entries, ultimately writing out into files, into a log repository archive, files that we call segment files. Each of these segment files that the builder creates has one log entry per line. And the files are also sorted in UID order. And because the timestamp and date are the most significant bits, it means that these files are each sorted in time order. And because there are a lot of repeated strings in these files, we see a really good compression ratio. On average, these segment files compress by 85%. We also choose a very specific directory structure in this log repository archive that is optimized for the way that we'll be reading the log repository later. It starts with a top-level directory for the log entry type, in this example, org click. 
The next directory are the first four characters of the UID for all of the log entries in that subdirectory. And because this, the first part of the UID is based on the timestamp, this corresponds to roughly 9.3 hours of time. So all of the log entries in this subdirectory are within this 9.3 hour time range. Taking it one character further, the first character in the file name is the fifth character of the UID. Putting that together with the second directory, we have the first five characters of the UID. And this corresponds to about 17 minutes. And so at most, each segment file can contain log entries that span a 17 minute time window. Lastly, we have a unique number towards the end of the file name. And this is so that we can support more than one segment file per type per five character UID prefix. And the reason that we wanted to do that is so that we could better predict the resources required by this builder machine. And what that means is fixing the amount of memory that each builder process is able to use. And since the builder uses an in-memory buffer to sort and deduplicate these log entries, when the buffer fills, it needs to flush to disk. And when it flushes to disk, it creates a new file for that five character UID prefix. At this point, this is what the system architecture looks like, with the two independent syslog and g servers receiving their own stream of log entries that get written into the raw logs. And on one server, we have a builder process that is creating this log repo archive. It's a small step adding rsync mirroring every minute to add redundancy for this log repository archive. And now that we have two separate streams of raw logs and we have the same log repo archive on both servers, we're able to ensure the consistency of the archive by running a delayed builder on the second server which compares the output from the first builder to its own output and adds new segment files for log entries that were missed by the first builder. This also causes multiple segment files per five character UID prefix. And the next major component in the architecture is a process called the log repository reader, or reader for short. And its responsibility is to provide access to the log repository. And using a simple request protocol, the log repository reader reads the segment files from the archive and provides a sorted stream of entries to a TCP-based client as quickly as possible. The request protocol looks like this. It's a start time and end time and the log repo type. That's it. I want to walk you guys through an example of using simple Linux utilities to send a request to the log repository reader and receive a stream of results. So in this example, I'm building the request using the protocol I just talked about. So the first field is the start time. And the format is in milliseconds since January 1st, 1970, which is the start of Unix time. The next field is the end time. And the last field is the log repository type. Sending this over a pipe to a utility called netcat I'm able to make a connection to the log repository reader process and send it this, this request. And ultimately, I receive back a UID sorted stream of log entries as a result. Under the hood, the reader makes it, takes advantage of that directory structure that I explained in order to isolate to only the information in the log repository that the request cares about. So I'm going to walk through the same request, but detailing how the reader reads from the segment files on disk. The first thing it does is isolates to the type directory. The next thing it does is it converts the request timestamps into their UID prefixes. In this example, the start timestamps UID prefix is 15MT0. And the end timestamps UID prefix is 15MT7. The next thing it does is finds all of the segment files that match that first UID prefix. And then it needs to read all of those segment files. Now, remember that each segment file itself is sorted in UID order. However, when we're looking at multiple segment files, it's possible that the, 
that all of them taken together are not sorted right now. In this example, if we were to simply stream back the first file to the client and then the second file, the client would not receive the log entries in UID sorted order. So it's the reader's responsibility to sort these and provide that single stream of sorted events back to the client. The reader should also make sure to never send back log entries that are outside of the request timestamps. Once we finish processing that first UID prefix, we move on to the other UID prefixes until we get to the last UID prefix for the end timestamp. As we're operating on these segment files in that last UID prefix, as soon as the reader sees a log entry whose timestamp is beyond the end timestamp, it considers that file to be done and finishes processing the rest of the files. Prior to introducing the reader, this is what our architecture looked like with the syslog-ng servers creating the raw logs, the builder creating the archive, and the mirror between the servers. And since the reader only needs to read from the archive, this is the way that, our, that we started the architecture with the reader simply running on the syslog servers and accessing the archive directly. And this is the architecture that worked for us for the first few years. We had a single data center and a cluster of application servers, and we had these two log repo servers that each ran the syslog and G, the builder, and the reader process. However, as Indeed grew, we saw more job seekers using our site, and we created more products, and we expanded into more data centers, and all of this meant more log entries. The reason that we moved into multiple data centers is so that we could decrease the latency for our job seekers, but also increase the redundancy of our data centers so that if any one data center failed, the job seeker could still have a low latency experience using our site. And all of this led to happier job seekers. So when considering how to augment the log repo for supporting multiple data centers, we realized that the consumers of the log repository only really needed to live in one data center, which meant that we could, we only needed to run the reader in one data center. However, we knew that we would have applications in every data center that would be creating log entries that we cared about. And in order to minimize the internet traffic, we decided to run the two syslog servers and the builders on those syslog servers in every data center. And so, this diagram, I'm showing three separate data centers, and this is roughly how it works today, where on the top right in the data center in the blue, I'll call data center two, and it actually has the two syslog ng servers with the two builders. In this diagram, I'm just showing the primary syslog ng server for that data center. And on the top right, the data center in orange, data center three, the, the same thing, where it's running the two syslog servers with the builders, and each data center independently maintains its own log repository using its own log repository builders. And then we replicate those log repositories back into data center one, which is at the bottom, which is where our consumers are running. And the reader process reads from this archive that has all of the data center's data. When we had just one data center, this is the directory structure that we used inside of the log repository archive with the top level being the type and the subsequent directories and files being the timestamps, the beginning of the UID. When we started expanding into multiple data centers, we needed a way to separate one data center from another. And so we introduced a new top level directory with the data center name. And this is necessary in order to avoid collisions. In this example, I'm showing two separate segment files that come from two separate data centers, data center one and data center three. However, they share the same segment file name. And this is totally possible because the builders that created these segment files are operating in independent data centers and they don't know anything about the other data center's log repository. We also said at the beginning that UIDs needed to be unique. So the way that we guarantee this when we have multiple data centers is by harnessing the server ID field in the UID. 
what we do is we give each data center 256 server IDs to start. So the first server in the first data center gets server ID 0. The second server in that first data center gets server ID 1, and so on and so forth. And this architecture worked for us for the next few years, where we had multiple data centers. And in each of those data centers, we had the two log repo servers that were running syslog and g and the builder processes. And we had the one consumer data center that was running the reader and where all of the consumers lived. As we continued to grow, we had more log entries and ultimately more consumers of the log repository. And what we started to see over time is that there were a diverse type of requests that were happening. And for example, the, the first consumer might be looking at job search request logs from the last month. And the second consumer might be looking at uh, resume creations over the last two days, and so on and so forth. And to a point, this was fine. Uh, the diversity of the requests were able to uh, get to the reader and get their responses fast enough. However, when we continued to increase the number of consumers and had an, an, an ever-growing amount of diversity, we noticed a bottleneck. The, the single server that had an array of disks underneath the reader process couldn't keep up with the amount of diversity coming from all of our log repository consumers. And so we wanted to eliminate this bottleneck by spreading the log repository accesses across a cluster of servers. We were already using this thing called HDFS at the time, and it stands for Hadoop Distributed File System, which is a distributed file system that stores data on commodity machines, providing very high aggregate bandwidth across the cluster. We needed a way to bridge the gap between our existing log repository archive and HDFS. So we created a process called the HDFS Pusher, which, as fast as possible, takes each of the segment files from the archive and copies them into HDFS. Once the log repository is in HDFS, the consumers are now able to read directly from HDFS rather than accessing through that original reader server. To maintain resiliency for log repository inside of HDFS, we store each log entry on three separate servers and three separate disks. Additionally, to make the log repository available as soon as possible in HDFS, we simply mirror every segment file from the log repository archive into HDFS. What this means, since we're storing still by data center, by type, and UID prefix, that we would be creating over 500,000 files per day in HDFS. And unfortunately, HDFS doesn't do so well if you try to do this. HDFS works a lot better if you have fewer files. And so we wanted a way to reduce the number of log repository files that we were adding to HDFS. And we created something called the HDFS Archiver, whose responsibility it is to look at yesterday's log repository data that is already in HDFS in the segment file format and collapse those into a file one file per type and four character UID prefix. What this means is that we'll only be adding 2,500 uh, 2, files per day to HDFS. And as you can see, over a month, this really starts to add up and we decrease the number of files in HDFS and allowing us to scale our use of HDFS a lot, a lot more. Using a number of technologies that Indeed created and a number of open source technologies, we're able to create the system that we call Log Repo, the distributed event logging system. Today, the log repository for all time is approximately 150 terabytes of compressed. Um, it has tripled in size since last January and tripled in size from the previous January. This graph is showing the size of the log repository over the last four years. Uh, with 2010 being on the far left, and it's barely even registering on the scale. So we're growing. 
As an example of what we're able to do with log repository, these are the 129 different metrics that we're able to compile from the job search event set. And job search is just one of 114 different event sets that we create from the data that we log in log repository. Every day at Indeed, we create 5 billion new log entries. Our application spends 0.03 milliseconds to create each of these log entries. We add 500 gigabytes to our archive, which gets triplicated into HDFS, adding another 1.5 terabytes into HDFS. And our consumers can read this information from HDFS at an alarming 18.5 gigabytes per second. We have hundreds of consumers that are requesting 1,000 different log repository types from the log repository every day. And to talk more about how those consumers access the log repo, Jeff's going to come back up. Thanks. Thanks. So as Jason said, I'm going to be talking more about how we actually consume log repo here at Indeed. There are four primary types of consumers. And this includes command line access, standard Java programs, programs that use Hadoop, and monitors. As Jason described earlier, we can use command line uh, tools such as Netcat to access log repo. And the great thing about this is it allows us to reuse standard Unix tools in patterns in order for us to do one-time analyses of log repo data. So here's an example of how I would look at the, the slowest search times over a given period of time. First, I, I use Netcat in order to get the stream of log entries back. Then I grep for the key and value that I'm looking for. I pass that through another grep just to pull out the value. And then I sort it in descending order. In the dark ages, before we had lots of other types of consumers, this was our, our most common way of looking at our log data. However, even today, it's still extremely useful. And you can do things like parse out just the query string to see, to, to get an idea of what types of searches people are looking for. Programmatic access is trivial, and we can access log repo from Java, Python, PHP, and PIG. A typical log repo consumer is written in Java and runs on a single machine. These consumers tend to read one primary log event type, and they read maybe a dozen children. We call the combination of a parent event and all of its children an event set, and in total, they may be on the order of 10 kilobytes in size. One of these consumers will read millions of log entries spanning one day or more, usually. And we run thousands of instances of these consumers every day. So this means that we're going through tens of terabytes of data in processing. Because of the amount of volume that we're going through, it's very important for us to be able to efficiently parse data out of our log entries. And we found that at the start, log entry parsing was just too slow. So in order to be more efficient, the two things we cared about were being fast and minimizing memory usage. So I'm proud to announce that as of today, we have open sourced our URL parsing library that we use internally at Indeed. And this is in charge of parsing data out of our log entries as well as query strings out of URLs. And this library can do it four times faster than using string.split to break out data into key value pairs and then splitting that further into a map. It also generates 50% less garbage than doing that. It's able to parse one million events of log entries that are half a kilobyte in size in three seconds. And here, I've included a link to our GitHub page where you can find all of our open source projects, as well as a direct link to the URL parsing library. And I'll bring this up at the end of the talk as well. We still ran into the limitations that a single machine can provide. So we began to use Hadoop. And Hadoop provides a reliable, scalable way of doing distributed computing. Today, most of the new consumers we write are actually using Hadoop. And as Jason said earlier, these consumers are able to read log entries directly from HDFS. By, using, by utilizing our cluster of machines, we're able to scale further. We also use log repo for monitoring. And we want to be able to monitor our business and operational metrics. After deploying new code especially, we need to make sure that searches haven't been broken, nor are they suddenly taking twice as long to 
to perform searches. And in these cases, available soon just isn't good enough. We use Datadog, which is a third-party monitoring service. And the way it works is that we stream metrics to their third-party servers. And from there, they aggregate the information and show us dashboards in real time. The dashboards look something like this. Here's an example of average search times from instances in a data center. However, we still have the problem of needing to parse metrics out of our raw log entries. And in order to do this for Datadog, we use a language called MiniEPL. MiniEPL is an implementation of the Esper processing language, which is written in-house at Indeed in Python. The way it works is like SQL for streams of log entries. And even though real-time access wasn't one of our original goals, because of the nature of log repo and its loosely coupled components, we were able to easily extend it to get around the latency of having to go through the builder process. To do this, every server that has an application that produces log entries also runs a process called the Datadog agent. This Datadog agent reads the locally written log entries and passes it through the mini EPL, where it can then parse out the metrics we care about for monitoring. It then uploads those to Datadog HQ so that we can see the dashboards. It's important to note, however, that these dashboards are, they can only show us aggregate information, and we don't have fine granularity access to our data. Log repo also provides a form of data redundancy for us, and we use that in a couple different ways. First is for replaying events. So Indeed has a feature called job alerts, and job seekers can provide a query for jobs that they're interested in, and every day or every week, we'll send them an email of new jobs that match their query. After one of our deploys, we accidentally broke job alert sign up for logged in users. However, we were able to use the Apache access logs to first get the alert parameters that they were trying to create alerts for, which includes the query that they're looking for, the location that they're searching in, and the radius that they're willing to look for around their location. And these Apache access logs also included the tracking key of the job search UID of the search that they were trying to sign up for a job alert from. We were able to find these job alert, uh, sorry, we were able to find these job search log entries, and from there we could figure out what account IDs were actually trying to create these job alerts. And together, we were able to recreate the job alerts for those users. Another very important thing that we use log repo for is for click charging. And at a very high level, this is how it works. When a user clicks on a sponsored job, first we write all the click data to a database. We then log that same data to log repo. Once a process is verified that the database contents match what we wrote to log repo, we're able to charge for the clicks. And then we can profit. So what else does log repo enable? It enables us to answer our business and operational questions, and from that, we can make data-driven decisions. A lot of the graphs that I showed you earlier were from an internal tool called Ramses, and Ramses provides a high-performant way of querying our log repo data. So here are some other examples of what we can see in Ramses. For example, what is the average, color, what is the average cover letter length for applications inside the US versus outside? And here in red, you can see that inside the US, cover letters tend to be about 115 characters long. But outside the US, they're more like 200 characters long. We can also take a look, at, a look at things like hour by hour, how does mobile traffic differ from Japan than from the United Kingdom? We can also see from what countries are users creating job, uh, sorry, from what countries are users creating resumes from? At the start, we just launched resume upload for United States, which is here in red, and other English-speaking countries like Canada and Great Britain. But as we added more and more countries, we can see that the percentage of resumes created from US users decreased, and other countries began to fill up more of that space. We're also able to see from what domains are users opening our job alerts from. And the interesting thing here is that uh, in earlier, earlier in 2013, uh, represented by the green line, which might be a little hard to see, but uh, 
Yahoo actually was the domain most people were opening job alerts from. And a little bit below that are Gmail users. However, at the end of 2013, Gmail began, began automatically proxying image loading. And before that, users had to explicitly specify that they wanted to load images for their emails. And since the way we track uh, people who open our job alerts is through these image pings that we get, Gmail suddenly jumped up past Yahoo as the provider that had the most job alert opens. We're also able to take a look at from what operating systems are users downloading our mobile job search app from. Here in red is iOS, and in blue is Android. And at the very, very, very top, tiny amounts, that's Windows phones. We can also see operational things, like when uh, one data center fails, how long does it take for traffic to shift over to our failover data centers? We'll talk more about Ramsey's in our March Tech Talk, but I just wanted to give you guys a taste of what it can do. The important thing to note is that Ramsey's and many other tools all use Log Repo as the foundation of their data. I'd like to now open the floor for questions on Log Repo.